Hi folks, today is going to be lesson one in my three-part lesson series on the Hare Krishna movement, here on Lessons from the Purple Chair. Hi, and welcome back to Lessons from the Purple Chair, one intellectual's musings from the comfort of a big purple wingback. <laughs> I'm your host, Professor Timothy R. Crow. Okay, we're going to go back to 1965. A very frail, little old Indian man gets off of a freight ship that came from India. He's in not very good health, very small, covered in saffron robes. He's got on uh, these rubber sh pointed shoes. And he brought with him a box, a, a trunk of books, uh, some doll, uh, and about what's estimated to be about eight dollars in rupees. And from from that beginning, by the time he died, about twelve years later, he had something like twenty to thirty thousand followers, several hundred. Um, uh, worship centers, um, uh, several working farms, several restaurants, and he had co started a, a full religious movement in the United States and throughout the West, in London and, and in other parts of the West. Uh, and this gentleman, whose name was A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, had started what we know today as the International Society for Krishna Consciousness which is more commonly known as the Hare Krishnas. Now the Hare Krishnas, you used to see them a lot more than you do today. Um, back in the 70s, you know, the uh, late 60s through, through to the early 80s, you would see them in, at bus stops, you would see them in train stations, bus, you know, bus stations, uh, outside of, uh, in, in, in um, main courtyards, you know, and, and uh, they would be have shaved heads except for a little ponytail in the back. Women, we, we aren't wearing the the the, uh, the Indian uh, shawls, uh, you know, and they, you know, and and they would be playing drums and playing cymbals and sometimes and these little accordions uh, that they use and and singing, you know, chanting the same the same uh, tune over and over again. This mantra: Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari, over and over and over again to this music, and they would work themselves up into you know into to a fervor, uh, you know, and just to a, a static state. And the whole time they're selling books and they're taking donations and they're giving out flowers, you know, and they they would become a very normal part of the American landscape for quite a while. And most probably people just saw them as this strange cult. Uh, you know, the, there were a lot of cult, what people call cult, uh, new religious movements that popped up in the late in the '60s and especially into the '70s. You know, there were there were a lot of them. Some of them were very serious and and still continue, and some of them, yes, were kind of cults and uh, financial ripoffs. However, the Hare Krishnas are much more complicated, and in fact, they're much more. They actually are not some sort of newfangled. Uh, cult, they actually come from a very ancient religious pra practice and tradition that dates back to at least the 5th to 6th century CE uh, and particularly reached um, its crescendo uh, with their founder in about the, in the 1500s. So, the, you know, the, this, is a this is a very legitimate Indian tradition. And I, I have a little bit of, as you know, I'm a professor of comparative religious studies. The Hare Krishna has always had a little bit of a fascination for me. And even even young, when I was younger, I went and visited them. I did a lot of field work with the Hare Krishnas. I read a lot of their literature, you know, a lot of Bhakti, uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's books. Uh, you know, the, and he did some wonderful translations and, and uh, you know, um, and commentary on a lot of these, uh, some Hindu uh, scriptures that pertain to this movement. So, I, you know, I really have been looking forward to doing this particular video. Now, 
there this is a big subject in fact it's such a big subject that I can't really do it in one lesson so you know just like a class we're gonna do this in three lessons this will be lesson number one you know and I will warn you in this one I'm going to take it back to back in history so you understand exactly where they come from and what it's about and and uh, their perspective and their cosmology and their ethics you know uh, as, and their practice uh, you know, in, within the Hare Krishna movement, you know, so we're going to go back to the beginnings of, of uh, talk about Hinduism in general and this movie, movement specifically. I'm going to go over a lot of philosophy of, uh, of this movement as in comparison with others. So, you know, be prepared. I get to be very professory in, in, in these videos. And hey, even though I may be throwing you a lot of information, take advantage. I, you know, for me to teach these in college, it's you know several thousand dollars per class. <laughs> the, the, the college is going to charge you. I'm doing it here for free, so you know, so take advantage of it. <laughs> okay, to get started, let's talk about Hinduism, and itself is an umbrella term. Uh, you know, and please excuse me, but because of time restraints, I am going to have to make this kind of a crash course. So anybody out there that really knows Hinduism, you know, please pardon me. I'm definitely, you know, there's going to be a lot of big subjects that I'm just going to skim over just to, to give give people uh, relevance, to give what I'm going to be talking about relevance and kind of a platform for, for understanding for those that don't know. Okay, that said, now Hinduism, the term itself, is much more of was a Western creation. When uh, when uh, early explorers or early people, that, Westerners that came to India, you know, when they encountered these religious beliefs, they kind of called it, you know, uh, uh, umbrella, give it this umbrella term of Hinduism, based on the Sindhu River, you know, the, the Sindhu beliefs, you know, people of the Sindhu, you know, so the, and I got shortened to Hindu. Uh, so any belief from India, except for Islam, uh, would be seen as, you know, Hindu, or, you know, the, the Hindu people believe, Hinduism. And really, it is a blanket term. And it's even, you know, a big umbrella term. Now, even though today, modern people from India, uh, you know, or, or, or Indian, Indian people that live anywhere else that are of this, of this Indian, ancient Indian faith, they use the term Hinduism as well. And in fact, there's kind of evolved kind of a modern form of religion that really could be called Hinduism. Uh, kind of one little one package thing. I'm not going to go into that here, but in truth, the belief systems of India are vast, you know, and sophisticated. It's vast and sophisticated, and you could, uh, and probably in an entire lifetime, you could not read all of their their sacred literature. You could not study all of their all of their beliefs and all of their rituals and all of their practices. It's just too varied it's just too vast and I will say this you know we think of the Greeks and, and their philosophy you know and you know with Socrates and, and, and Aristotle and you know and Demogenes and all the rest but in truth there, there is not a philosophical ideal or a religious ideal or practice that it, that hasn't probably been first thought of in India <laughs> I mean, you name it, it's, it's existed in India. Now, most people in India will, will, uh, you know, will call their, their religion uh, Sanatana uh, Dharma, which basically means the correct or the, the correct way, you know, or the harmonious way, which really does fit most of the what's called Hindu uh, uh, sects and, and groups. Now it's true, th running throughout most of m the majority, not all, but the majority of these of these sects and these groups and these different you could call denominations of, of different sects and all you know is a is a running common cosmology. They do most do believe in thing in uh, multiple gods. Um, most do believe in uh, karma, cause and effect. They believe in a certain eth eth uh, ethic guideline towards life, and, you know, and, and as well as a social expectation and, and social ethic. Uh, and they also share a belief in, uh, in kind of a form of either enlightenment 
uh, you know, a moksha, uh, you know, or you know, or some sort of of ultimate concern with achieving achieving a witness with God, or um, an enlightenment. But this ultimate goal is already always usually within these belief systems, and most believe in the will of rebirth or or the the cycle of rebirth, uh, the uh, reincarnation. And and it's and it's how, how but now how all of that works and what gods do what and and who is the supreme and who is not, and uh, you know and how those mechanisms of, of karma and reincarnation work and and that ultimate concern can be vastly different from from one Hindu group to another, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, but you know, um, let's talk about a little bit of the history. What we call Hinduism, or the the belief systems of of, of of ancient India and present India, date back. They are one of the oldest religious traditions in the world, and they actually have the oldest scripture in the world. That being the Veda. Um, in fact, the Rig Veda is the oldest known scripture in the world. It dates back to about 2000 BCE, so we're talking 4,000 years. And the early Veda, the, 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 the books of the Veda, were actually passed on, uh, you know, verbally, an oral tradition, where it was, audi- you know, through a, through a mnemonic audio tradition by which they used different sounds and movements. Different sounds correlate with the different movements of the head so that you can stay... Um, so we can keep it pure and keep it pronounced correctly, uh, you know, uh, and passed on from student, from teacher to student, for four thousand years, and they're still doing it. They still teach this, the, the, teach the Veda in this, and the, the Vedic knowledge in this way. The, uh, it's it's an incredible thing. One of the oldest traditions on earth. Now. Most of what the Veda talk about are is kind of a cosmology of the gods, uh, the 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 myth uh, the myth of creation, which whenever actually whenever you say mythology, technically mythology is supposed to be about the create about a creation story, uh, you know that's technically mythology. So when people say the myth, that you know when scholars say the myth, they're ta- that's what they're talking about. Um, so you know, and the, the the Veda has that. It has talks about you know certain ha- the creation. It talks about certain t- certain gods. It talks about certain practices, certain ethics. You know, it, it's it, you know, and this is from the very earliest of the what's known as the Indo-European uh, language. You know, written in you know that's recorded in Sanskrit. The, uh, actually, some of the people call often call the 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 proto Indo European language. This is that ancient. We're talking to the Stone Age up to the present day, which is just amazing to me. But you know, just like anything else, it 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 is starting to keep evolving. Another more uh, uh, more solid type of of teaching, philosophical and devotional. That it was was the Upanishads, and the Upanishads basically mean the teachings, and these were the teachings of the great teachers, uh, you know, these great gurus and swamis. Actually, it's even believed that Vyasa the uh, wrote wrote these, who would actually commune with the gods, and, you know, and um, these were, and, and these the the Upanishads really are different teachings of different philosophies of philosophy, you know and about and they talk about meditation they talk they talk about certain types of practices they talk about devotion they talk about about um, different forms of worship and sacrifices and ritual you know and they're ver- they're very com- they're very complex and very deep and they they're considered part of the v- Vedic uh, the Vedic teachings, and you know, which they starts to become the Vedanta, the teachings of the, uh, of the, uh, the teachings uh, of, of the Veda, uh, you know, the Vedic tradition. So it's not just the old, the old original Veda that's the, uh, that's called called Vedic. It's all of the traditions that followed with it, mostly with the Upanishads. Now, among these, you know, then after that, you have different teachers and scholars uh, you know, of these religions that would read the Upanishads, read the, the, um, the, the, the Veda, and they would come with their own, they'd extrapolate and give their own interpretations 
and their own additions and apply them to their f f school of philosophy you know and then other people would write a you know something contrary to that and this just keeps going on and on um, you know and so it, it starts to get you're starting to get into just a massive amount of of text you get a massive amount of what's considered sacred uh, writings now, now alongside of these uh, these philosophical schools and incorporated in these philo different philosophical schools in Hinduism was of course the the gods and there are a myriad uh, of gods in, in, in India was all of them have most have stories and epics that go along with them full myth full mythologies uh, that, that fit in with this larger cosm uh, Hindu cosmology um, and, you know so you and, and all of those are written down <laughs> so add that to the all, all, not only the teaching of the schools but all of the teachings of the different gods the different myths the different epics and you know let's not forget that the longest epic in in literature the longest poem in literature literature the Mahabharata which is over like over a hundred thousand um, um, verses comes from out of India <laughs> it's the great story of in the great ancient story of India and Krishna will venture in that we're gonna be talking about Krishna in a minute but you know once again we're just the the pile of texts and literature is ju just getting higher and higher but uh, among the among the gods, and there are like I said, there are a lot. There were really three that you could say have a certain dominance, uh, you know, um, and or and gods that are related to these gods, like the family of the gods. These these there are three that become more prevalent. Uh, you have Brahma, who was the creator, the creator god, the creation of all things, and then you have Sheva. The destroyer who both who both creates and destroys in this in the cycle in the in the cycle of, of, of cosmic reality you know he, he creates and he destroys you know almost in this continuing cycle he's like the cyclic the cyclic god uh, you know as well as well well as other things about Shema uh, but and then you have Vishnu the sustainer uh, now what's interesting is out of these three gods. There comes this certain monism within uh, the certain uh, certain monism within within the the gods. There is this oneness, I should say, more of a oneness, a common belief in, in mo among most Hindus, which is maybe reason that they're so tolerant. You're not going to find a much more tolerant religion. I mean, they th these different groups and religions, uh, uh, which are really a little small religion, all existed in India, pretty much peacefully and tolerantly. Uh, you know, so uh, because of this overriding belief that you know all the gods are kind of a reflection of one greater reality, like one great cosmic god, um, the Paratma, the great god, uh, and that this all the gods are kind of a personality uh, or a different or a different aspect, almost like a different archetype. Um, or you know uh, a different characteristic of that God being expressed. So you know, and that's kind of, and now it's now there it's true. There are, there are a lot of people that these gods are, are in, seen as individualistic, you know, and almost polytheistic. But this uh, about but this almost you know, the, but this belief that all the gods come from this one one divine reality is pretty prevalent and has been even since ancient pretty much Upanishadic times uh, but then it becomes an issue as to you know uh, and, and Hindus often describe it like this is that uh, you know humans only have one or two personalities if you're mentally ill or three or four or something like that but you're mentally ill but we have only one personality but God the, the, the omnipotent and transcendent divine would not be limited to just one personality. They could be thousands of personalities, but yet only one. And that's the way many, especially modern Hindus, and even into ancient times, view the gods. This, uh, so it becomes this issue, though, um, as to, okay, who is God when he's just God? You know, when that great divine reality, when he 
kicks back <laughs> to watch TV in his abode or whatever, you know, lets his hair down. What personality is he? What go what is his true personality? Well, different Hindu groups, like I said, these schools think it's a di it's different. Uh, you know, think it's different gods. It, um, for instance, the 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 the, the Shavites believe that when God is just God, his true personality, he Shiva, he's Shiva. You know, and there you that's where you get the Shavite, and they have their all their own uh, mythologies and epics and and philosophical works and commentary on the philosophical work. Once again, this take a lifetime. I don't think in a lifetime you could read it all. Um, and but then of course then you have uh, the the uh, the groups you know the Vaishnava, and they believe of course that Vishnu, uh, the sustainer, uh, that he is the is the ultimate uh, you know is God's true personality the true the true God and that the others are kind of like part of him you know so Shiva Shiva would be part of Vishnu and so would Brahma you know and 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 the ultimate reality it's actually Vishnu but even more that than that with Vishnu it becomes more interesting because Vishnu is the one God that has avatars we've all heard of avatars especially from the the, the movie. But actually, avatars are ones that descend. In other words, Vishnu is the god that would actually incarnate himself on Earth, you know, and, um, and to help mankind out. It's even said in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, whenever there is a need, I appear. You know, I come to Earth to settle a certain thing. And according to them, there's thus far been been been, the, you know, the 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 nine incarnations. Um, so. And one of which they believe was the Buddha, and this you know they believe that that Vishnu would come in different guises, to e to either help save mankind or to guide mankind the right way, even if it was sometimes to get them to go this way so they could come back again in another version and get them to go that way. <laughs> I know I'm simplifying this, but that's the way it works. So what's interesting is that there are a lot of these Vaishnav uh, that believe that. Uh, you know, certain one of these avatars could be one of you know be actually the the true personality of Godhead, the original personality of Godhead, or supreme personality of Godhead. That's what our Christians call it. The supreme personality of Godhead would be one of these incarnations, uh, one of one of these avatars. Whether it be whether it, you know it could be Rama, or, but especially the the eighth incarnation, and that would be. Krishna. Krishna is one of the more more po popular uh, gods in, in Hinduism. He is often worshipped uh, to be a true incarnation of God himself. Uh, the original, you know, true God. Not half man, half God. True God. And Vishnu, I mean Vishnu, Krishna, the name actually means, the word means black or dark. Um, it's often, you know, some say it's like the dark, a dark storm cloud. It also means beauty, uh, but originally it meant black. That and that Krishna is often shown as having this dark blue or even black skin, which is often described to be like the color of the eternal, the celestial sky. The sky is blue, and also a, of a storm cloud. Uh, you know, and, and he is shown as as absolutely perfect in his beauty. No skin blemishes. He's a god, so no skin blemishes, nothing like that. Uh, you know, and he's su such so beautiful. It almost looks feminine, you know, because he tr transcends, um, you know, just pretty or or beautiful, you know, or or handsome for a man. He's went into the level of of ultimate beauty. So when you see these pictures of Krishna, he, you think kind of looks feminine. That's why, because his because his handsomeness transcends, and. Krishna is a very interesting god, even in the even in, in the world religions, because he's one of the few gods, maybe the only god, that is worshipped as a and has has stories and mythologies and is worshipped as a baby, an infant. You know, this who when he was seventy was small, he he stole butter. You'll find pictures of him as a baby stealing butter, um, as a child, as this mischievous cow herding. Uh, a young man playing his flute, and, a, and then also as a as a uh, as a lover, 
you know, with uh, where he was constantly in these seductive love affairs with uh, w with the Gopis, the the, the cowherd girls, you know, and also as a, as a teacher, where he teaches Arjuna on the battlefield uh, and gives him the an entire religious lesson and talks about the entire cosmology, uh, you know, um, of of the will of life and death and and, and, and correct practice, uh, you know. And th in that small section of the Mahabharata, which is called the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of the Lord of Krishna, which is one of the most beautiful and, and one of the most beautiful pieces of religious literature I think in existence. It's actually one of my favorite. So Krishna is a very, very interesting God, and he's one of the few out of the incarnations. Uh, he's he's one of the few that is seen as pure God, and thus not because God is transcendent. He's not really seen as an example uh, for human behavior. Everything that he does is usually seen, you know, within the Vaishnav and their their their, um, their metaphors of his life is seen as some sort of metaphor for divine and devotion, not so much like a lesson you would get from like a half man half god, like with Rama who was who had human f um, failings. You wouldn't get that with Krishna. Krishna is pure God and therefore transcendent. So everything that he did is not really for humans, a uh, human example, but as an example of devotion. The people around him, how they react to him, the gopis, the princes, the his the cowherd friends, you know, the animals, how everyone reacted around Krishna is the example of his of devotion to Krishna, not an example of Krishna giving for man to live. Krishna tells you how to live. He doesn't give you the example of how to live because he is a God transcendent. Makes him very interesting, even in the Hindu, uh, in the H Hindu pantheon. You don't find another God like this. Um, you know, and and Krishna is of course extremely was is extremely popular as a God, even today. Another interesting thing about Krishna in his, if you read the the uh, the Krishna Lila, the the story of of. Krishna's life and pastime and this myth it talks about uh, and he lived in you know in in um, a section of India up up in you know, Vrindavan and in in that in those stories you know it's it, the stories are interesting because it talks about he was uh, there was a prophecy that his uncle who was the king would uh, be killed by by the the child of his brother so he sought to kill Krishna before he was born, and he got moved to uh, another family of cow her herders where he was raised and become a cow the cowherd boy. And he did all these these pastimes of fooling around with go the gopis, uh, of stealing butter, you know. And he f and, he, and then finally, and there were several attempts on his life. Snakes came, and he killed the snakes. Uh, a, a giant came, and he killed that. Uh, all sent by his uncle Kamsa, who was who was after him. And does this story sound familiar? Yeah, it's a story of Hercules, almost exact, almost exact. Uh, and actually, that's because of the Indo-European migration. These stories, these myths, um, got carried on. The names of the gods changed, you know, and the names of the, pe of the people, the heroes in the stories. But these heroes stayed the same. So the story of Hercules. And the story of Krishna, it's very obviously that, that this story come out of come out of this same Indo-European tra uh, tradition, you know, just being passed passed along, which I find fascinating. But that's something for another day. <laughs> now, getting back to with these gods, also comes these schools of, of philosophy, and there are so many. <laughs> uh, there's even an atheistic school in in Hinduism. So, but. Uh, the, the, there are so many that I'm basically going to cover just two that have the most bearing on the Hare Krishna movement later on, which also was the Bhakti movement. Now, the 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 two schools I'll talk about would 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 be what's known as the Samkhya, which is dualism. Now, dualism is a philosophy that says that the the spirit and the body are two separate things, and the real and the the divine reality. And and the and the the, the uh, and the spirit are two different two, are two separate things, um, and in the in that philosophy, it's seen that what you have to do is find, uh, you know, 
it's fine a harm create or find a harmony um, or a or an order that was that's been lost and brought it bring it back to that order so that's where you get traditions like meditation you know overcome your body and and the body and soul the body mix, mixed with the soul that comes out of that Med, you know uh, yoga you know the the, the where literally is the physical and the spiritual get combined that's where these type of, of practices come out of um, and, and like I said even the meditative schools and in a sense um, even though Buddhism and Jainism are separate religions they kind of come out of that same tradition of the the mind and the body are kind of separate from the soul and or you know the, the from the from the the soul or the or, or or the either that or the ultimate it's a, a barrier to the ultimate um, achievement of some sort of enlightenment moksha or nirvana and that you have to work to do this through mental practices through physical practices or meditative practices that's where these traditions come from now there is also a or, or it even can be through worship of the gods and devotion you know and ritual that gets you back into that from the more from the more what you call traditional Indian beliefs so but uh, the other one is a form of monism which the most popular version of that would be Advaita Vedanta and Advaita Vedanta is basically the teaching of that and monism is a teaching that God is the only true reality the only thing that really exists and everything living is really part of him like a great ocean and where each, every every living thing is a drop every spirit is a part of that ocean it's the part the Brahman the you know the the Brahman you know the the great you know and the um, and everything you know the Brahman the bra you know the uh, excuse me I got that Brahman the and the Atma, Atma, the the spirit has to become part one with is one with that. Everything else in, in the physical is a uh, seen is not seen as real, but an illusion, and that uh, that illusion has to be overcome. The Maya, the the, the illusion of the world, and that you become one. The whole part, purpose is to realize that and become one with that great Godhead, one with the Godhead. You know, with, with this great, this great uh, um, reality, and these were debated <laughs> quite a bit. In fact, the, uh, the Advaita Vedanta was made it was made even more popular through the works of, of Shankara Acharya or Shankara. Shankara was a great, um, you know, a great uh, um, a, a great Hindu guru who wrote several commentaries on the on the Veda and the Upanishads, and he and he re he really. Um, uh, you know, promoted this idea uh, of the 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 Brahman, the the great reality of God, and us becoming one with God. And then there were others that um, that were more dualistic, that wanted to you know um, that wanted to debate this with him. You know, and and within the Vaish within the Vaishnava, you had um, several uh, you know teachers like Ra Ramanuja and, and Madhava uh, who. Really, were against this this ideal of, of monism, of, of that we lose our individuality into uh, this great this great spirit. Um, so, and I know I'm using some high language here. Let me put it this way: uh, the, the people that believe in the the, uh, the the monism, it's like this one great cell, this one great you know this great ocean. And you're just a drop. Everything's a drop in that ocean, and it's automatically melted all into one. There's no separation. Separation is an illusion. You know, we, like when you see, when you, you pull, you know, when you 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 see see water dripping, you think of each individual drop. It's not each individual drop. It's it's one one whole. That's them. Now the the um, the whereas the dualist schools would see it a little differently. They would see it as the that you know uh, that each each one of those each one of those spirits is individual even if they are part of a whole for instance like cells in the body now each living cell in our body and we have millions of them are an individual living piece of tissue it has its own system its own identity but yet it can really exist without the rest the rest of us it would die so you know it is interconnected even though it is individual it is part of a whole so that would be more of a qualified form of dualism uh, so like there is a great God 
head this you know this great reality but each se each soul is not or spirit is not lost in that reality it means it's individual individualism yet is is connected and part of that greater reality and that would actually be the 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 philosophical school that will be promoted you know later on with the Hare Krishna movement that is their outlook is like yes there's a great godhead but one there is the one, the true personality of godhead is going to be Krishna and Krishna is Vishnu the, the is the great re, um, celestial reality the great divine reality and even though when we we want to, we want to or through devotion we want to become one with him but at the same time even through that oneness we remain individual you know in 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 kind of the in Krishna's uh, Krishna Loka the the great realm of Krishna where we become one with him through devotion that would be their school I told you India's got it all <laughs> And that's just two, and I'm very, very skimming the top of that water of that that divide of that divide ocean. Trust me, I like that metaphor is made. <laughs> so yeah, so that's I know that's a little weak, but that is kind of Hinduism in a nutshell. Now central to what we, to the Hare Krishna movement later on is the is is the Bhakti movement. Now the Bhakti movement, which actually the Hare Krishna movement, which I want to talk about later on, is a is a form of bhakti yoga, bhakti or the bhakti practice. Now, bhakti actually comes from from Sanskrit word baj, baji, or which means to divide or to share, or you know, uh, or to partake. But it's you know, actually, it also does mean devotion and love. It's actually kind of come down to mean a loving form of devotion. And bhakti, bhakti practice become started to really spring up as almost like a, a grassroots movement among, uh, uh, among all not just one but a lot of these different Hindu or, or ancient Indian uh, religious sects. Not just you know it become you know and what this this um, what this really was was um, songs and poetry, love poetry. And devotional poetry to the gods or to the ultimate god or, or individual gods and the jubilance of that usually brought it bring also brings in music and drums and cymbals and 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 this and singing and it's it's that it's kind of that type of devotional worship that you know that started to become very popular Around about the, around about the the fifth, fifth to the uh, the uh, the fifth to the si to the seventh uh, centuries CE, and a lot of, there's been a lot of speculation as to um, you know, where these where these uh, the, this come from, what what, what influence this has it had. It does seem to have started with um, the Nayanars and, and the Avars. The the Nayanars were these. Um, these uh, the devotional saints and poets to to um, to Sheva, the Shevites, and they wrote these devote these beautiful poems and songs, you know, of devotion and love of the god Sheva and all of his attributes and all of his abilities and all of his mercy and all of this. And they would write these poems and these poems would be sung in these songs and they would be sung in, in groups. And they work themselves, you know, work themselves up into as an aesthetic states through 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 their devotions, and also uh, uh, with the Alvars. And the Alvars were the were um, poet saints of of Vishnu and the Vaishnava, and they wrote these beautiful uh, poems and and, and um, songs of devotion to Vishnu and his avatars, including Krishna and Rama. Uh, being the, some uh, Krishna, of course, being some of the most one of the most popular. Now, there's as I said, there's been a big debate and a lot of different theories on what caused this uh, this this bhakti movement to sprout and and make it grow, and where it came out of now, and what influences caused it. Now, some now among the Hare Krishnas, they will say that bhakti was a reaction. To the more meditative uh, practices of Hinduism and uh, Advaita Vedanta, which had no devotion, and that's not true because we know that there, that the, the Bhakti movement ran across all gods in most of these schools. You had Sh you had Ad 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 Advaita Vedanta uh, Bhakti, 
<laughs> believe it or not. And you had, you know, uh, you and you had dualistic bhakti, and you had, you know, so it wasn't, and you know, it, it, that's not, you know, that's not one answer because they had it across them. Um, some have said that it was it was overall a reaction to Buddhism and its meditative tr traditions, and you know, uh, which sometimes can be seen as non-theistic or not giving emphasis to the gods, but more to meditation. So therefore, this was a uh, a, a, a reaction to to uh, to those practices to bring a devotion to the gods. Um, others ha have said it was a reaction to the more caste system. Uh, because anybody could participate in, in bhakti of any, it, so it broke down um, the, the the caste system and the bra and the Brahmin and, and the predominance of the, of the Brahmin rituals. This was much more free, and anybody could participate. You know, uh, this was almost like the Pentecostal <laughs> movement of, of Hinduism. You know, others say that it had a huge influence with the in when when Islam came into India around that time. And um, the Sufi traditions, which do include a lot of this, of this singing um, and chanting devotion, you know, like a good example is the uh, is the whirling dervishes in Turkey, you know, but the, but the these uh, devotional practices of trying to become one with God through loving devotion with, with the Sufis was picked up by the was picked up by the Hindus and for the Bhakti. Now, which one do I think of those are correct? All of them, yeah. I don't th see when it comes to these type of religious practices. People will sit and say, "Well, it come out of this, or it was caused by this, you know, or it was caused by this, and you know, not caused by that." See, I, I, to me, it's it's what I call the the chicken stew theory. <laughs> you know, if you just take chicken, stick it in water, and boil it, that's not chicken stew. You know, that's just chicken in its broth. That's not chicken stew. What makes the chicken stew? Well, you need the chicken. You know, it brings. Some, you have the main chicken, and the water that brings something. The carrots and potatoes they bring an element in. The spices, you know, the 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 uh, the the, the uh, poultry seasoning and the and the peppers, and the salts and the garlic powder or whatever else you're putting in, that brings its element. Uh, you know, uh, so you, all of these and all of those put together, all those individually are not. The chicken stew, it's all to what it put it all together. Each one brings its own elements to create that chicken stew, and that's the way that I see most of these like uh, these type of religious uh, um, uh, practices and traditions, you know, developing and evolving. It's not one thing, it's different things that all brought in. I think that yes, it probably was some reactionism to Buddhism and you know, and some of the more meditative practices. That, you know, one thing puja and worship and devotions, but in India, for though any place there's been gods, you have devotions, you have these type of uh, these type of beliefs. But I do think that these type of practices became popular because it was outside of caste, because it was it, it did it give more of a a zealous and and um, heartfelt expression than. Um, than the the Buddhism and the Vita Vedanta, I do think that it it was influenced later on by the uh, by the by the music and the chanting and the traditions of the Sufis, but th that brought some their element into that tradition. So all which one caused it? All of them, all of them brought this. But this is how it evolved. Religious traditions are like snowballs; you roll down a hill, they pick things up and they grow, you know, and they pick up all the elements as they go. And that's that's what I how I think bhakti evolved. It wasn't just it was a reaction to this. It was. It was a reaction to that. It was. He got influence from this. Of course it did. It's all that's what created bhakti. You know, and that's the beauty of uh, of religion and philosophy is we they pick up different traditions to create this chicken stew. Now each one of these bhakti schools and these these uh, different uh, philosophical Vedanta schools in in uh, in Hinduism, these different sects, they all have a tradition of sampradaya. And sampradaya is the tradition of a guru or master teacher, master spiritual master teacher, who takes on disciples, and those disciples who are initiated, you know, that they they themselves. Learn from them; they become they become gurus and, and spiritual masters, and they take initiate initiates. And this this line of teaching goes right goes right down. And in most Hindu Hindu traditions, 
you know, you're only legitimized if you are part of, you know, if you are part of, or, or I should say a a school is only legitimized or a guru is only legitimized if they come from one of these sampradayas, one of these lines of teachers. And they go, some go back thousands of years. And of course, some even claim that their line go all the way back to the beginning of the gods, <laughs> you know, have been passed on. It goes back to, to mythic era. Well, within the Hare Krishnas, what people call the Hare Krishnas, which is a Vaishnav, uh, Vaishnava uh, tradition. What, in other words, they see Vishnu as the highest, uh, as the true personality of God. And even more specific with, um, with the Hare Krishnas, they see Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. When God takes his hair down, he's going to be who he really is when he's at home. He's Krishna, as far as as the, the Hare Krishna uh, movement, the, uh, their version of, of Vaishnava, is concerned. And the beginning of this tradition, or at least the, uh, the Sampradaya that they really count themselves from, um, which actually even there is just a section of it, but is from uh, one particular uh, religious saint uh, um, named Chaitanya, uh, Lord, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And, treated, and and it's from, from out of him which we get the Hare Krishna movement. Now, uh, Sri Krishna Chaitanya uh, was, was born, born uh, Vish, uh, Vish, Vishvampar Mishra uh, in 1486 in uh, Na- Navad- Navadweep, Navadweep um, uh, India, which is basically in, in, in West Bengal. Um, so and he he started when when he started off he first started to be want to be a scholar of, of Sanskrit and 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 the the, the works of, and the Vedanta works and he actually it said that he was very scholarly in this he from a very early age he would argue with different and, and debate with different religious leaders and gurus and they were all impressed with how well he did however after the after his, when his father died. He made a pilgrimage to Gaya, and there he actually met uh, uh, Ishvara uh, Puri, who actually was a guru in the line going back to the, to Madhava Acharya, who taught a qualified for this qualified version of non-dualism that I spoke of earlier. You know, where you know we're all, all we're all individual cells of the body, but we're all part of God, but still individual. You know, he promoted that school. Um, so, um, and Ishvara, um, and Ishvara Puri was, was a guru in that line, and he got initiated by him. And it's said that after that, um, Chita- um, uh, Chaitanya changed uh, completely. Um, you know, he, he suddenly, when he came back, he, rather than being a, the scholar, he was the devotee. He was very devoted, and he, and through his te- through his education and teachings and his. He had a real, real, real um, obsession and, um, uh, you know, real, real uh, fanaticism, you could say, about, and de- about his devotion and the devotional, um, um, a- the devotional uh, acts of bhakti. Suddenly he was very into the bhakti or bhakti yoga. And in fact, he, you know, he reserved different, different mantras. Mantras are... A group of words meant to help achieve some sort of enlightenment, or some sort of of um, connection with with uh, with the divine, and the one that he one that become most famous with him is what's known as the Maha Mantra, which I mentioned earlier. Um, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari, and he would sit and rep- you know and on the beads, and he would chant this. Thousands of times a day, and then and then and and in celebrations, they would chant this Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Start off slow and build it up and build it up and work himself into, you know, like an endorphin induced, you know, euphoria and and, and um, adrenaline induced euphoria. Um, in fact, in fact, it's said that he would work himself so so far up and actually he would start having visions. And or we could even say hallucinations, you know. He would see Krishna and chase after him, and they'd have to run him down. Um, he would he would pass out or go into catan- uh, catatonic states for hours. 
you know he was um, you know in fact he's even one, one time he actually ran into the ocean because he thought it was the river Jumna and he chased after chasing after Krishna because he thought in and actually almost drowned in a, in a fisher boat picked him up and brought him back his followers had had to keep an eye on him and in fact he finally took uh, Sunyasi which is the ascetic uh, or basically a, mo a celibate monk order um, and he actually took that with it at Rita Vedanta but even though he was um, a you know he was very much bhakti va Vaishnava bhakti and he after he did that he traveled on all these holy sites through in India and he finally ended up in in Puri and which is uh, was his modern day Orissa um, and that that there was the great temple of Jagannatha and Jagannatha basically means Lord of the Universe, and it's in the guise of, of Krishna. These these um, very primitive looking, but very powerful looking uh, um, wood statues of of Krishna and his brother Balarama, you know, and and and, it, and so and when when it said that when he arrived at this city of Krishna and this great temple to to uh, Krishna as as Jagannath, the, the Lord of the Universe, when he walked in the door to them, he was overwhelmed and he passed out. He went into a trance-like state and had to be taken to someone's house, and he remained in this trance-like state for hours. Yeah. Now, some people have speculated that uh, Chaitanya may have had mental issues. <laughs> no insult to Hare Krishna followers out there. I'm just doing a scholarly thing. Some people have called him the Mad Saint. I, I don't th I think he was just a, just a, um, a euphoric I think you know he just worked himself up you see this in other religions like like I said with the Sufis will work themselves into religious you know uh, 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 almost a religious delirium a you know aesthetic state um, you see it like with the Pentecostal the holiness who will work theirself in these states pass out you know speak in tongues even handle snakes They'll bite them and it won't kill them. Their adrenaline and everything is, is so high. You know, drink poisons and all this other stuff. So this, you know, voodoo, you have this type of, a, through music and chanting, you work yourself into this type of aesthetic uh, um, state and mentality. So this is not alone in the religious world. And um, and I think Ch Chaitanya is one of these type type of, of practitioners of that type, reaching, reaching what they consider this euphoric higher state, which brings them closer to God and that's you know that's what he was doing but he <laughs> yes he would pass out for days at times and he would pass out and they had to keep an eye on him he'd run in the ocean you know and you know but at the same time he did start with this the kirtan practices Sankirtan, which was these huge celebrations these huge almost like parades of devotees with with the, the clay drums with with the cymbals uh, and and they would do the chant of, of Hare Krishna over and over again, working themselves up. And he was, you know, dancing through the streets. And he he would do this with thousands of people. And the thing is, it became attractive not just to the people of all different castes, which he was he was against people of a caste system. To him, this was the rather than using meditation or you know real complicated uh, Arthur, you, you know. Yatha yoga techniques, you know, with, with the bending and the and, and the stretching and all of that, you know, meditating for years. In his belief, this bhakti, this devotion, it brought you. That was that that overrode all of that. It would bring you closer to the divine reality, bring you closer to a oneness with Krishna. And and when he reached this euphoria, he felt like he was one with Krishna. Now it's a bit of a debate as to how how. Um, Chaitanya died. Now we know he died in about 1533. All the biographies and hagiographies agree with that. However, how what happened to him is a little bit of a mystery. S some of the biographies say that, and the most popular ones is that he merged with a statue of Jagannath or a statue of Krishna. In a, in a great light, he just merged with it and disappeared. You know, other traditions say that while he was uh, performing the yatra. Uh, the cell where they move um, the Jagannath from one one temple to another, and this is still done every year. That in his dancing and in his say he actually cut his foot, uh, and and that went septic, and he died from that. 
Um, another version says that he, one of these aesthetic states, he ran in the ocean and drowned and was never seen again. Another tradition says that, you know, he, um, he slipped, he basically ran away. He slipped out of, out of town and disappeared because at this time he kind of become a well-known saint, a well-known guru, and, you know, a worshipful guru um, in Puri. Um, so, you know, what exactly happened to him, we don't know. Now, there is also some, in some of the biographies, even a mention that he may have been an epileptic. And that may have actually answered some of his catatonic states, his passing out, all that. But, you know, still, I do think it's more of, uh, of religious euphoria, you know. But if he was epileptic, that could actually bring some of that on. Um, but, that, you know, a lot of specula still a lot of speculation. So what exactly happened to him? Not really sure. Um, There's even one said that he had kind of like a seizure and died, was found in the temple, and they secretly buried him behind the temple. I think they've even looked for him there and haven't found him. But, you know, whatever happened to him, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, he, it does appear about 1533 he, die, he died somehow or disappeared somehow um, at the age of 48. Now, even during his lifetime, he was not only seen, he came to be seen by his followers and definitely the followers after him as not just a great devotee and guru to Krishna, but an actual incarnation of Krishna himself. So he's an incarnation of an avatar, <laughs> you know, come to this age to teach this, this, this bhakti yoga, uh, the, this devotional bhakti yoga who chanting the maha mantra of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. And you know, in fact, the Hare Krishnas themselves uh, believe that he is an incarnation of Krishna. And they call, we call him Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, so, and that he was the great example to, uh, for people to follow. So it's kind of interesting. Remember I said that Krishna is not one that actually is an example to mankind because he's transcendent. So it's more metaphoric of devotion to him. Chaitanya kind of fills that gap. Because suddenly here is someone who's living an example of what you should be. So they see that 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 Krishna is in, incarnated uh, himself as Chaitanya to give the example of proper devotion and worship to Krishna, to God. And in fact, it's even said that the different attributes of the God incarnated in some of his most direct followers uh, that were around him, you know, uh, so which. I find that, you know, which is, and it gets kind of complicated there. But, uh, but anyway, what's interesting, um, uh, even though Chaitanya was said to be a great scholar and, you know, of Sanskrit and, and a great scholar of the Vedanta, the works of Upanishads, the, the Veda, he actually wrote very little. In fact, he only wrote eight um, short stanza, stanzas, sh eight short little, little um, shlokas, the little prayers. Um, you know, uh, and that's it. Just had these eight little one paragraph uh, a piece, um, uh, basically devotional prayers or, uh, that he wrote, um, which are, of course, you know, uh, uh, chanted and, to, you know, and, 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 and reviewed through, through, through uh, his followers. And in fact, his form of Vaishnava come to be known as Gadea Vaishnava. Which Gadea Gada refers to Bengal, so Bengali Vaishnava. Some people even call it Chaitanya Vaishnava, but you know, um, uh, but you know, it, and it's from the Gadea Vaishnava that the Hare Krishnas come. Hare Krishnas, uh, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and their gurus and their and their founder that got off that boat back in 1965 is Gadea Vaishnava, going all the way back to Chaitanya. Now, even though Chaitanya didn't teach, didn't really write anything down, many of his, scholar, many of his followers, the swamis that came out of him, um, the gurus that came out of him, um, his tradition, his disciples were, particularly Satanana um, Swami, Jiva, uh, um, excuse me, Rupa Swami, and who were brothers, and then their nephew Jiva Swami, and Raghunatha Swami, they they were great scholars of of religion. They were great scholars of of um, of Vedic religion, the Vedanta, and these schools of, of philosophy, and as well as the this non dual this this qualified non dualism 
uh, Madhava uh, uh, Acharya and, and the Sampradaya coming from that and they wrote several they wrote lots of books and commentaries and you know on on the Vedic uh, uh, traditions and on the epics and the stories of Krishna you know which is called which is the Bhag Bhag uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam Bhagavata Purana uh, the story the the life story of Krishna and on on, on the Upanishads and on the teachings of, of Chaitanya and his slokas they wrote a ton of books <laughs> and 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 they started their own some their own took their own initiates and and um uh, their own initiates uh, and devotees uh, uh, and, uh, and apprentices under them, and that and it's from one of those lines going back to uh, uh, Jiva Goswami and Raghunatha Goswami that you get you come down to the to the man who started the Hare Krishnas in the West, and that's what we're going to talk about in our next video in, in lesson two. So keep an eye out for it. <laughs> Okay, folks, that's all I've got for the, this segment of the Hare Krishna Lesson 1. Look forward, like I said, to Lesson 2. And I'll have that out as soon as, with, as soon as I can next couple of days. And hey, if you're liking my channel, please, uh, you know, subscribe. You know, go down, hit that little purple chair, and give me a subscribe. Give me a like. Also, if you have any questions or you got want to say something about the, the, um, the Hare Krishna movement uh, or the Vaishnava movement or the Gadaya movement, uh, please say, you know, um, I'd love to talk about these type of things and have discussions as long as they're polite, uh, they're pol as long as they're, they're generally impolite. You know, I don't like to debate. Um, so, but, I, but I'd love to hear from you. So until, until our next lesson, you know, find yourself a, 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 good, uh, a, a good comfortable chair, get yourself a good book, maybe on, on the Vaishnava, and, and find your passion. Later.